They're going to start the online services. Is it going? All right. So uh, this is the day the Lord has made, right? Every day. And he says, we will rejoice in it. So even though there should be great rejoicing as the family of God comes together to worship together, to praise God together. And, uh, you know, it's, if you see somebody you don't know, you can wave to them, you know. And after the service, if you want to give them a bump or you want to give them an elbow or if you want to shake their hand or hug them, whatever you want to do. Um, the church is open. We are open. You can wear your mask. If you don't want to wear your mask, don't wear your mask. Um, you know, praise God that uh, I don't think there's one person in our congregation that um, got the virus and passed away which not one um so god's protection has been here and we're so glad for that and uh so today we come together to worship the lord we're just palm sunday which is a great day in the church this week whole week so many events have taken place which we'll talk about during the sermon today and uh but it's a day where the people were saying hosanna anybody know what hosanna means Save us now. Save us now. Hosanna. Save us now. Let's bow for prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for every person here today. Bless them. Pour out your spirit upon them, Lord. May you just uh, give them a fresh touch and renewal of your spirit today. Lord, as we worship together, as we get into your word together, as we have fellowship with one another, May you be here in a mighty and powerful way by the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, it's a great day to come together. Beautiful weather outside, you know. Um, but may we be people that are not afraid to share the gospel. Not afraid to share the good news about you to all this world, to San Diego, to United States, wherever it is that we go, that we would represent you as shining lights. So bless this service. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. So be it. If you'd like to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. Um, let's just worship the Lord together. The songs, most of them will be up on the board. And uh, so you can follow along. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Whoa, 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 coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms whoa, down and every chain will break and his broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty our God is the Lion the Lion of Judah he's roaring with power and fire For the King of Kings As a God who comes to save Is here to set the captives free For who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Jesus 
Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, oh, oh. oh. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 One more time. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And none can stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. The sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Now it's 
Jesus, hallelujah. You may be seated. We'd like to welcome all the visitors that are here today. Um, we have a few announcements that we want to go over. Uh, for the ladies, there's a ladies Bible study on Thursday night at 6.30 here at the church. They're going through a foundational book, the book of Genesis. And uh, so if you can, come out on Thursday night this week. It's every other week, so they meet twice a month. And then on Wednesday night, we have our Bible study here again at 6.30, our Tuesday night Bible study at 6.30, going through the different scriptures. Friday night this week, you should have a flyer, right? Everybody got a flyer about Friday night? What is it? Good Friday. Good Friday service. So we will be meeting here at 6.30 on Good Friday to celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so we hope you can come and join us, and we'll take communion together. And then on Saturday night, if you come Saturday night or you, you're doing something on Sunday this week, Saturday night will be our Easter service at 630, and then Sunday morning, just like today, at 10 o'clock. So, you know, take those home with you and uh, look at them. You have an April calendar in there as well to remind you about all the things that are going on in the month of April, so you can take a look at that. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, Jeremy, come on up here. <clears throat> Jeremy's going to share a little bit with his wife about what God is leading them to do. And they're going to be going with Wycliffe uh, Bible translators. And uh, so I said, hey, why don't you just share just a couple minutes about what's going on, where you're going, what you're going to be doing, and uh, introduce all of his family. Good morning. So, uh, God put it on our heart uh, back a long time ago, uh, over 22 years ago, um, his heart for missions uh, for not just the people here in the States, but also people in foreign countries. And um, so, both my wife and I, uh, before we, we ever even met each other, said, yes, God, uh, we were willing to go. Um, and then he said, okay, good, now put it on the altar and leave it that desire. Uh, and we did that. And now 22 years later, uh, I'm retired from the Navy. And we've just been waiting and waiting. God, when, when can we go? When can we go? So now we're out of the military. And now God has opened up the door wide for us to actually join missions. Um, and we've joined Wycliffe. <coughs> and we have a video for you. So What if God's word had never been translated into English? What if we couldn't understand God speaking to us through it? The Bible changes lives, but only if we can understand it. Right now, 1.5 billion people in the world don't have the Bible in their language because it hasn't been translated yet. To them, it's as if God doesn't speak their language. Through the work of Bible translation, many people have parts of the Bible. How will people come to know God without knowing John 14, 6, or Psalm 23, or Genesis 1? It's time to change this. We long to see every person have access. 
access to God's Word. So we work with churches and Christians around the world, translating the Bible into the languages people understand best, teaching people to read so they can read the Bible, and helping people to apply God's Word to their lives. We do all this so that just like us, people can be transformed through hearing God speak to them in their language. They need you to be part of this work. Go, give, pray. Wycliffe. Wycliffe Bible Translators was um, originally founded in the 1950s, and they have had the privilege of translating scripture into many different languages. There are actually 7,000 individual languages in the world and 2,000 of them still don't have a single word of scripture translated into them, which blows my mind because God's word is powerful. We, I mean, all of us here know it. It's through the word of God that we know about him. And so Jeremy's going to share a little bit about um, a story. This is a true story from a Wycliffe missionary in um, Eastern Europe and the impact that it had on a girl's life. Um, her name is Annie. <coughs> To Annie woke in a cold sweat. Her dream had felt so real. In Annie's dream, the devil was trying to capture her, and she had run to the homes of other believers, but no one would help her. Then a man dressed in white started beckoning to her, and she went to him, thinking it was Jesus. Instead, he grabbed her and removed his mask, revealing himself to be the devil. Annie woke up, convinced that Satan was trying to steal her out of God's hands, so she called us to ask if she could come over and pray with us. Annie and I had conversations about the power of the word of God and about the importance of knowing the truth in our spiritual battles. But she had never really seen practically what that looked like. I had her read John chapter 10 out loud. Here Jesus says that no one the Father has given him will be lost, and no one can take them from his hand. As Annie read, her eyes opened wider and tears started pouring down her face. Really? Satan can never take me from God's hand, she said. Annie worried that God would get tired of her pleas for help. So I showed her Romans 8. I, I can go confidently to God over and over, she asked. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate me from him. She also told me she was afraid that no one really loved her and that no one could. And that no one could. So we went to Isaiah 43, 1 through 4, which talks about what and talks about God's love for his people. Her response was the same. I am precious to him. I could have just told Annie these things. Uh, she would have listened because she loves and respects us, but my words wouldn't have changed her. In fact, I've told her many of these things before, but she has a hard time believing me. There's just something about the word of God itself. And until that moment, Annie did not truly understand the importance of reading and studying God's word. We sent her home with the scriptures in Russian, her language of edu education. And we also gave her a copy of Luke and Acts in her mother tongue, Dakti. At first, she didn't know what it was. And she said, I can't read this. I told her to try again, since the alphabet is similar to Russian. Then she finally started to understand. She got so excited, she started bouncing up and down in her chair. It's my language. It's the scriptures in my language, she said over and over. I can't wait to share this with my mom and read it to her. We also gave Annie MP3 recordings of Luke and Acts. These have been especially encouraging to her mother, who doesn't know the national language well enough to read and study scripture. One day, we pray that Annie and her people will know the power of the whole Bible in their own language. It's the whole reason why we're here. So you've seen from the video, there's still one and a half billion people in the world who do not have the word translated into their language. And that's the goal of Wycliffe Bible Translators, so that nobody can have that barrier and everybody can see. We see through Annie's story and we all know personally how powerful the word of God is. The word itself says it never goes out void. It always accomplishes what he intended for it to do. But if people don't know it and can't hear it, how can they be changed by it? We are privileged to be able to start um, working with Wycliffe Bible Translators. 
and our area will be in media, which deals exactly with this. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll be able to produce MP3s um, of audio Bibles, um, specifically for oral speaking, oral cultures. So here in the States, we're a literal uh, culture. We, we read books and we learn from reading. Um, and we're taught to read. Uh, in many cultures, they're an oral-based culture, so they go from memory. All their stories are passed from memory, from uh, orally. Uh, so when you try to bring a new alphabet into a culture that's never had an alphabet and try to create a written language um, in a culture that's never had it, it can take years. It could take decades. Um, you literally have to change their culture to a degree. Um, so what my job would be, I'd be creating media. I would be bridging that gap. Um, through mp3s through dubbing the Jesus film um, through teaching the community and the local ministers how to uh, work with radio stations how to produce drama how to do um, everything that an oral based culture would be able to understand um, and doing this all in their mother tongue in their heart language so we're here today we're given the opportunity to invite you guys to partner with us, uh, to join with this mission of making the scripture available to the Bibleists. Uh, and um, so it's a huge privilege that God has given us uh, to be a part of this, to, to be sent to do this. Um, and you know, if you're asking yourself, you know, how can I actually be involved in this? Um, you can partner with us. We have uh, um, cards that we brought along. And if you're interested in joining with us um, on this, either through prayer, uh, through encouragement, um, or financial support, um, uh, just get with us after the service, and we'd be very happy to talk to you about this and get the Bible out there. So, and Obviously, we love the Word of God. It is the most powerful book in the world, and we are excited to see it change lives, and we are excited to help partner with you guys in this uh, ministry. Thank you very much. So as a church body, we love to have people go out from our church to different places. And, you know, we've started 12 different churches from this little church here in our last 40 years. And uh, they're out everywhere. And uh, we have Sal out in the um, El Cajon area working with the Chaldeans out there. And Samuel McCracken that's doing ministry. And uh, there's a ministry going on in Mexico and the Wycliffe Bible translators. How many uh, countries don't have the Bible? Do you remember? 2,000 languages. That's quite a few people. 2,000 languages. All right. You can imagine if we were living in one of those countries and they have no Bibles. We all have Bibles. We have so many Bibles. If you don't own a Bible, there's Bibles in the back there. Feel free to take one. We have that many Bibles. And, uh, you know, we need to get God's living word out everywhere. So um, thank you. And we'll be telling you more about what they're going to be doing and prayer letters and different things as we go along here. So let's have the ushers come forward and we'll receive our tithes and offerings the last Sunday of the month. And so all the church bills are do on this uh, day so be in prayer about that and then we'll get into God's word here so Lord thank you how you bless us Lord so many people have gotten a $1,400 stimulus check and uh, so many people have their unemployment checks and plus what the government's given to them and pensions and retirement and jobs that you provided you have been so good to us Lord so whether it's, you know, $1,000, $10,000, or $1, Lord, that we would give faithfully that tenth, that tithe to you. And the Lord, we ask that you would multiply it for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I worship you, I worship you. 
Maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's who we celebrate today, Jesus. So if you don't have a Bible, the ushers will be glad to get you a Bible. Open your Bibles up to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, does anybody know who the world champions were? Of what? Of football. Tampa Bay. All who I know were, is it was Tom yeah, who Brady. cares? I didn't even remember who they are. Who was the world champion of baseball last year? The Dodgers. Who was the world champions of uh, basketball last year? The Lakers, right. 
Now, all three of those world champions, they had big parades going on in their cities, and they had the trophies, and they had big, you know, long pro pro professional, processional, <laughs> you know, and there was a big celebration going on because they are world champs. But more importantly than that, there was a big celebration that was taking place 2,000 years ago as Jesus entered Jerusalem. As Jesus entered Jerusalem. And there's actually a big part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are called the Gospels, is about Jesus last week. And, um, it, you know, in your Bibles, if you read those four Gospels, a large part of it just talks about Jesus entering in Jerusalem, what he did that last week, you know, the crucifixion, and then the resurrection. Actually, one-third of your Gospels talk about these events. And so you probably have heard this story many times, but there's always new things that we can find as we go through the Gospels on Palm Sunday. Sunday... 2,000 years ago, Je Jesus entered Jerusalem. Monday, he cursed the fig tree. If you remember that story, he cl cleansed the temple of the money changers. Uh, Tuesday, he, his authority was questioned. And many of the parables that you find in the Bible and the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that happened on Tuesday. On Wednesday, Jesus gave us the parable of the ten virgins. Remember the ten virgins. Five were ready, right? Five were ready. What about the other five? They were foolish. They didn't have, they weren't ready, right, to go in. And they weren't ready for the bridegroom. I hope today that we're ready in case Jesus came back today. You know, I, I had a, uh, a funeral service, a, a celebration of life yesterday here at the church. And uh, there was this many or more people that were here. And one of the things I said to them is that if that person, a lot of you know Brenda Wheeler, she was 63 years old. If she were to come back, she would say, make sure you're ready to meet Jesus and come to this place that she is and her husband is, Larry, come, that you would come to this place, that your names are written in God's book of life. And, uh, you know, so all of us, you know, this could be the day that God decides to take us home. It could be tomorrow, could be next week, could be a year from now, could be 10 years from now. We don't know. But are you ready? Are you like the five virgins that were ready, had oil in their lamps, ready to go? You know, and when the bridegroom came, are you ready? Ask the person next to you, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready for lunch. Man, this preacher hopefully won't go too long. So on Wednesday, you know, also there was a story of the widow that put her little mite into the offering. And then the rich man that had the big celebration as he put his money into the offering. Hey, look at me. Look how good I am. And Jesus said she gave more. She gave all of what she had. That, was a, uh, that happened on Wednesday. Um, it's not the size of the gift. It's the heart, right? And Thursday, we have the upper room conversation, Passover, the breaking of bread, Jews, Judas uh, leaving to betray Jesus, the high priestly prayer in uh, John chapter 17, the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Friday, you know, when he went to the cross and paid for our sins on the cross. And so all these things, you know, started on Palm Sunday. John chapter 6, verse 14 says, when therefore the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is of truth the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus therefore perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now this happened before Palm Sunday. You know, Jesus' ministry was three years, but many times they wanted to take him by force and make him king. Hey, we want to make you king. We want you to get rid of the Romans. We want you to do some more signs for us. You know, I mean, hey, we're hungry. We, you know, the healings and everything else. But spiritually, their hearts weren't right. 
You know, have you ever heard, uh, a lot of you aren't old enough, but uh, the TV program, I Dream of Jeannie. Remember that program? Barbara Eden, you know, you rub the, the whatever it is and Jeannie comes out, right? And she will give you whatever you want. Well, that's what they thought about Jesus. Hey, Jesus, give us whatever we want. You know, and Jesus said, I came, I came to seek and to save those that were lost. And the miracles that he just, just backed up, that he was God in human flesh, that he was the king. And so now, the last week of his life, now it's time for him to publicly declare to everybody, yes, he is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the one that they were waiting for. And uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 9 in your Bibles. I think sometimes we can get the words up there. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 4. You know this, it was, it's uh, famous at Christmas time, right? It says in verse 6, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government or to peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The King, the Messiah. Turn to Matthew chapter 2, first book of the New Testament. We'll be jumping around a lot if you're new here. We uh, put those scriptures on that outline so you can go back and catch up with them later. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, and look what they said. Where is he who is born, what? King of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east and have come. What did they come to do? Worship him. The Messiah had come. Well, the Messiah was also prophesied so many times in the Old Testament that he would die to pay for our sins on the cross. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 16, here's another thing about the king. Revelation 19, 16, it says, And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. Now look at the, look at the name. King of kings and what? Lord of lords. Lord. It's clear from all the prophecies of the Old Testament from the, and then from the birth of Christ in the New Testament, from the reign of Christ, he is going to reign forever, e eternity. Now coming up, there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ and Satan will be loose for a little while. And then that eternal kingdom that hopefully... Every person here you'll be ready for that's described in so many different places is going to come. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, what? There you will be also. You know, one of the scripture verses we share at uh, memorial service, it says in his kingdom there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sin. I mean... The first things have passed away and all the things have become new. We'll have our new transformed bodies. You know, every person here in this room, you're going to die at some time. Every person. Chances are 100%. Unless the Lord comes back. And last, yesterday afternoon, there was a, uh, an urn with the ashes in it. And it says that we were created from dust and we return to dust but your soul and your spirit live on forever where are you going to spend eternity and then god says you're going to have new transformed bodies in heaven just like his after the resurrection i'm ready anybody else here ready for that any of your bodies feel like they're aching all the time and your knees and everything else so i mean i'm looking forward to that day 
So the king is coming in Psalms chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. He's described as the king of the universe. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, those are on your outline. He's described as the king of heaven. And then in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, he is described as the king of the church. He's the king of the church. He's the head of the church. You know, I, I mean, this church belongs to him. This building belongs to him. You know, you belong to him. You know, the, the, the son that uh, called me about the memorial service, just like last weekend when we had those two services, they said, hey, you know, how much will you charge us to have a memorial service here? I said, the body's already paid for it. It's free. It's free. We just want to bless you and, and remember a life that had such a great impact upon so many people. You've already paid for it. You know, they couldn't believe that it. it's already been paid for. And then you always hear this at weddings or funerals. How much do you charge, Dave? <laughs> I said, it's free. I don't charge anything. You know, I, I just want to bless you and get the gospel out. And they couldn't believe that as well. And, it, and the, all the people that were here, they were so blessed. And there were so many... Um, it was like a reunion in some ways because Brenda was worked at the school here for over 20 years. And, uh, you know, just remembering her life and some of the crazy things. She loved life. Do you love life? Jesus said, I came that you might have life and what? Life more abundantly. Man, we should have joy. If there's anybody that should have joy, it should be us. Right? Not just because Tatis hit a home run for the Padres. But we have eternal life. We have joy in the Lord. You know, I, it, it's so great to see Mac and Judy. And, you know, um, it's been a long time. You know, and Dan up front here. And, you know, so many others. You know, Chuck and Susan. And, you know, so many of you online. You know, there's still room at Calvary Chapel of Mesa for you. When you feel comfortable, come on back. We'd love to have you back here. Jesus is the king. Turn to uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It says in verse 12, this is kind of like, What's going on in the world today? In verse 10, he, Jesus, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. So many people don't know Jesus today. That's why Wycliffe is so important. They don't know him. And he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, that's you and I, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. If you believe in his name, you are a child of God. Uh, you, I, I mean, that's why we're all brothers and sisters. We're all related. I'm related to you, Buck. I'm related to you. You know, we're related to one another, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And... Uh, you know, there, but there are so many that fit into that other category. You know, cancel out Christianity today. Cancel out God's word today. Cancel out churches today. Be in prayer. This is a big week. They're going to be voting on, quote, the Equality Act this week. A lot of things will happen if that goes through. You know, I, I mean, if we declare the scriptures, we will be considered to be hate mongers and all kinds of things. And. You know, I mean, churches across America, and it'll affect all of them, and it'll affect our sons and our daughters, it's our grandchildren as they go to school, and, you know, when the opposite sex can go into whatever bathroom they want, whatever gym room they want, and, you know, so many things. If you read through that thing, it's a horrible bill. And it's going to be pushed, tried and get it pushed through. Be in prayer. Prayer can accomplish much. The prayer of a, of a 
faithful, righteous man or woman. <clears throat> they received him not. Turn to Luke chapter 19. Here it is. Jesus' kingly entry into Jerusalem. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. And it came about that when Jesus approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village opposite you, to which as you enter you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Man, it was a specific donkey that you know no one could ever have used it. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying this? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now, so it would be like me sending Jim right now out to the parking lot and tell him, Jim, hey, I saw a nice BMW out there, Jim. You know, could you, could you go ahead and, and take it for me afterwards? You know, I want to use it after the service. And then, you know, somebody sees him you know, getting into the car and hot wiring it for me. <laughs> and they go out and say, what are you doing? This is my car. And he says, well, the pastor has need of it. <laughs> and you saying, go ahead, take it. Go ahead, enjoy it. And I'll bring it back to you a couple years later, right? But, uh, and that was what the scene was taking place here. And I want you to write down in your outline, the entry, the triumphal entry was carefully planned. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't just chance. It wasn't maybe it'll happen. It happened just like all throughout scriptures. It happened exactly as Jesus said it was going to happen or the prophecy said it was going to happen. I mean, there's over 300 prophecies looking hundreds of years ahead that happened from the Old Testament through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Over 300. What's the chances of that? Well, someone had too much time on their hands, and they figured it out, and it would be like taking one silver dollar and coloring it red, going up in a helicopter, and as you're in the helicopter, there's two feet of silver dollars all the way across the state of Texas, and you're in that helicopter, and they push you out somewhere over Texas, and you're in your, what do you call it, parachute, and you land somewhere, and you're blindfolded, and you happen to pick out that one silver dollar with red dots. That's the chances of one person fulfilling only seven of the prophecies, exactly as God said from the Old Testament. Only seven. Can you imagine over 300? 350. Thank you. You got a cheat sheet. In Zechariah chapter 9, turn to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah is one of the Old Testament prophets. There's Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and then Zephaniah. I memorized them last night. <laughs> Here it is. Everybody have it? Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. I love this prophecy. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. He's humble, and he's mounted on a what? On a donkey. He's mounted on a colt. And then it says, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And um, in verse, well, we'll talk about that later. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, you don't have to turn there, but in Daniel chapter 9, it tells us exactly when the Messiah was going to come 
into Jerusalem. And I wrote down the prophecy for you. Jesus entered Jerusalem on April 6, 32 A.D., exactly 177,880 days after a decree went out to rebuild Jerusalem. And that decree was issued in March 14, 445 in the ba Babylonian calendar. And the exact day that was prophesied, you want to, you're a mathematician and you can figure it all up, 69 weeks of years, that's when Jesus came riding in Jerusalem. What an amazing fulfillment of prophecy that was. Amazing. You know, I was at 7-Eleven uh, just yesterday, and at 7-Eleven there was a guy there ahead of me in line, and uh, I was getting a Diet Coke. And as he was in line, he said, I want to buy some lottery cards. And he says, I got $1,400 stimulus check. I want $1,400. And he was going, which lotto cards he want? <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, it took 10, 15 minutes. It was crazy. And then he won a couple, you know, $100, $50, whatever. He just spent $1,400. And then he turned in those cards to see if he could win more. What's the chances of him winning, you know, that big amount that he was trying to win? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's one in millions. You know, what's the chances of Jesus fulfilling this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9? It was all carefully planned. God knew what he was doing. Jesus said so many times in those three years, my time has not yet come. And now he's saying, hey, my time has come. I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. That's what he said Good Friday when, or uh, Thursday night when he was with his disciples. My body, we're going to celebrate later, my body is going to be broken for you. My blood is going to be shed for you on a cross for remission of sins. And it happened the next day. Let's turn to uh, Luke again, chapter 19, verse 35. Here's the second point. Luke chapter 19. Verse 35. So they brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their garments on the colt. They put it on Jesus, or put Jesus on the colt. And as he was going, they were spreading their garments in the road. And as he was now approaching uh, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles that they had seen. Now, remember that Jesus had a price on his head. If he was going to go to Jerusalem, he knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to kill him. But he told his disciples, we must go to Jerusalem. And then he explained to them about he was going to die. But they didn't like Jesus at all. He was taking away their power. The, the, the people were flocking to see Jesus. You know, I, I mean, it was like to them, uh, they were jealous. They were envious. They were losing their power. They were losing his prestige, the prestige. And so Jesus didn't come some, in some back alley into Jerusalem. He came riding on a donkey with this big procession that was taking place because everybody wanted to go see this miracle worker. Everybody wanted to go see this person that raised people from the dead, that healed the blind, that, you know, killed people of leprosy, that, you know, all the different things made people walk. And, hey, we want to see this miracle worker. And the Pharisees are looking and going, we got to do something about this Jesus guy. According to plan. He would die as the Passover lamb. It was Passover time. And he would be our Passover lamb. He didn't disguise himself. 
He came openly. In uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 36, again it says, they were spreading their garments on the road. The whole disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. And they were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes. That was a direct claim from Psalms 118, a messianic psalm about the king coming. Blessed, oh how happy and much to be envied, if you were here last week, of the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then it says, and some of the Pharisees and the multitude began to say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. You know, they called him teacher. They didn't call him king. They didn't call him Messiah. They didn't call him great prophet. They called him teacher. Rebuke them. Tell them to keep quiet. Tell them they shouldn't be saying these things. They shouldn't be praising you. And I love Jesus' response, verse 40. He answered and said to them, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Now that was a... a the, I kind of wonder sometimes if they would have been quiet to see the stones crying out. You know, the first rock concert in the Bible, you know, crying out. <laughs> It was, <laughs> Jesus told them many times before this time, hey, don't tell anybody. Now he's saying, hey, I accept their praise. I am the king. I am God in human flesh, and I'm going to go to the cross. This, my time is now at hand. My time is at hand. Remember, Satan tried to get Jesus to take a shortcut. He, Satan's always out there tempting us, right? Trying to get us to take a shortcut. And the shortcut, the temptations were, remember the temptations in the wilderness? You know, cast yourself down from the top, of, you know, and God will protect you, he'll hold you up. And, you know, all the different things that Jesus said, you should not tempt the Lord your God. And he knew what his mission was. He knew what his purpose was the whole time. And so, the, you know, Satan is, is a liar. He's a thief. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. And uh, in our day and age, man, there's so much deception. There's so much lying. There are all these things that are going on. And uh, we need to be very careful. That's why we need God's word. His word is truth. We can believe it. It's trustworthy. You know, we need to get into God's word. And so Sunday came. Jesus had just spent the night at a feast at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus the night before. Anybody remember who Lazarus was? That was one of the people that Jesus raised from the dead, right? Lazarus. He had been dead, and he was resurrected by, by Jesus. Remember when he said, come forth, Lazarus? You know, I t always tell the congregation, what if he would have said, just come forth? And, and all the graves open up and everybody starts coming forth. Remember what happened when Jesus died? Many of the graves opened up and people were coming forth. That would have been a night of the living dead scene, right? <laughs> Not only that, but it says the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom so that the entrance into the Holy of Holies was now available to all of us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so Jesus, you know, the, uh, um, he left Bethany. He approached the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. He sent two disciples ahead to the small village where they'd find a colt, a baby, unridden donkey, um, Jesus got on the colt, rolled into the city. The multitude were there to meet Jesus. Even Lazarus was there. Now, one of the things the Pharisees said in one of the other Gospels is, we got to get rid of Jesus, and we got to get rid of Lazarus, because he is proof that he is the resurrection, proof that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. 
you know, it's not mentioned here, but they probably had to get rid of the blind man that was gained sight. Probably had to get rid of the person that had leprosy that was healed. Probably got had to get rid of the woman that had an issue of blood for so many years, and she was healed. Probably had to get rid of the lame man. Probably had to get rid of a lot of people because they were testimony of who Jesus was. Man, they were killing people probably, we wanted to kill people all over the place. And then the people. The people wanted a political king. Give us a political king. Give us somebody that will get rid of the Romans. And Jesus spoke out about this. You know, right now they're hailing him as a conquer. you know, just like a conquering hero. They're hoping that the revolution will now start. You know, that they'll overthrow Rome. But Jesus was making a statement, coming in on a donkey in humility. And one day he's going to come back on a white horse. On a white horse. Luke chapter 19, verse 40. And he answered and said to them, I tell you, these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached, he saw the city. And what did he do? He wept. Uh, he wept. That's the fourth point. He wept. You know, um, it was the last chance for many of them to accept Jesus before they hardened their hearts. And the prophecy was fulfilled also in 70 A.D., verse 44. It says, And they will level you to the ground, your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The king had come, but they, they wanted a political king, not a spiritual king. They didn't recognize that he was the king of kings, the Messiah, the Savior, and so this prophecy in verse 44 was fulfilled in 70 A.D., basically 28 years later. The Roman general Titus came and he destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Not one stone was left upon another. Because in the temple there was places where gold was all over the temple. And so he took the stones out to get the gold. And the temple was destroyed. Prophecy was fulfilled. He temp took the temple apart. And here we find Jesus weeping. I think if Jesus came to America today, he would weep. He would weep. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get some baby bottles from the Pregnancy Care Center. And uh, part of their, their fundraising, they... Um, have people fill up those bottles with just excess coin and, and it, to support their ministry. But they find that 70% of the women and their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever that come to the pregnancy care centers will keep their babies. 70%. How many go to Planned Parenthood and keep their babies? Very few. And so it's a great ministry that as a church we should be supporting. Because abortion, is, I mean, now with the new government and everything, we're going to be funding with our tax dollars, Planned Parenthood. Why are we funding Planned Parenthood? They're a, they're a private organization. Why are we giving them money? And I'm sure Jesus would weep over some of these laws that are being passed today. And, and so... He's weeping over people that reject him as their Lord and Savior. That's why Good Friday, you know, that service, people will come to a Good Friday service. They'll come to a, you know, a Easter sunrise or an Easter service on Saturday night or Sunday night when they wouldn't come to church any other times because it's religious. It's tradition. You know, Back here, the religious leaders, hey, uh, you know, the, the Passover lamb was, was sacrificed on the altar. You had to bring a, next week, bring a Passover lamb. Will all of you bring one, please? 
<laughs> I was going to have you cut them on the all but something like I can't remember exactly. It's 200 and I think it was 47,000 lambs. Because you brought one for your family. 207. I mean, that whatever that number was, it was in the 200 and something thousand. Passover lambs were killed as sacrifices for people's sins. That's a lot of lambs. And just, for one time, Jesus became our Passover lamb. So we don't need to sacrifice lambs anymore. He is the Lamb of God that takes away our sins. Verse 41, he approached, he saw the city and wept, and he said, If you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace, now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank, exactly what that Roman general did before you, surround you, hem you in on every side, level you to the ground. And then verse 45, if, as he entered the temple, he began to cast out those that were selling. And he said to him, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And every day it says he was teaching in the temple but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men, you know, the leading men, the politicians among the people, they were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for the people were hanging upon his words. That's amazing. The people were hanging upon his words because he didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers. He had as one having authority and power. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. This was his mission, the last week leading to the cross. Matthew 1, verse 21. And you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. For it is he, no one else, there's no other name by which a man must be saved. For it is he who will do what? Save his people. We are his people. Save his people from their sins. And how sad it was that they hardened their hearts and they rejected Jesus. At the bottom it says, Jesus wants to make an entry into our lives today as Lord and Savior. Don't reject Him. It's time to obey and give your life to Jesus. Open your heart today. Receive eternal life. Let's make a triumphant, let Jesus make a triumphant entry into your life. Start fresh. Start new today with Jesus. I don't want to miss the eternal life that you know, Jesus has for us. I hope none of you want to miss that. You know, I don't want to miss the things that he has prepared for us in heaven. I don't want to miss my heavenly home. You know, I don't want to miss seeing my friends, you know, that have gone before me, my family that has gone before me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. Renew our spirits. Give us a fresh touch of his spirit. Amen. Let's uh, the musicians are going to come back up here and let's pray. Lord, we need a savior. You're our savior. People are looking for hope today. You're the God of hope. There's so much fear. There's so much chaos. There's so much confusion. God, we need you. I pray that none of us would die in our sins and face eternal judgment. We need a savior. I hope on Palm Sunday today that we could let you make a triumphant entry into our lives. God, give us more knowledge, more grace, more of you in our lives. Sharing that faith in our community through Whitcliffe Bible translators, through sharing with our family, our friends, our neighbors. People need to meet Jesus, the Prince of Peace. God Almighty, 
Lord, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. But it wasn't a spiritual king they were looking for. It was a physical king, a political king. God, I pray that we would have a personal relationship with you today. Like that verse in Acts chapter 17, it says that the Bereans checked everything out in your word. God, that we would be like the Bereans, checking everything out, reading your word. There's so many people that have said, I don't want Jesus. He is the only answer. He is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father except through Jesus. The name above all names. At his name, every knee will bow one day and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. It says even the demons believe who Jesus is and they tremble in fear because they know they're going to be cast into the eternal fire forever. God, I pray for our country. I pray for San Diego, the leaders here. I pray for those in California. God, that they would open up their hearts to you. Not just cast you aside, not just push you aside. You're knocking at the door and you're asking to come in to our hearts. God, I pray that we open up our hearts to you. Lord, you say before we take of the juice and the bread, as often as we do this, you say to do a heart check. Where are we in our relationship with you? Have we asked you into our lives? Have we confessed our sins? You are faithful and righteous to forgive us, to heal us, to cleanse us. Cleanse us. You remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. But we need to call out and ask your forgiveness. So right now, Lord, around this room, and those watching online, we'd ask forgiveness of our sins. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is here. Your Spirit is speaking to our hearts. If we're not right with you, if we do not know that we have eternal life, today, right now, is the day to get right with Jesus. If we've blown it, which we all have because we're all sinners, that we'd ask God's forgiveness of our sins. That we'd be cleansed. Lord, that we'd start fresh with you. Maybe there's people in this room that need a fresh touch of your spirit. Man, they've been so afraid. They've been so anxious. They've, oh, it seems like there's no peace in their hearts. Today, they would find you, the God of peace. So if God's showing you something, if he's convicting you, if you need to ask him in your life, just raise your hand right now. You need a fresh touch of Jesus. There are many in this room. Is there anybody else? God bless you. Many. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. As we take of this bread, we do this in remembrance of you, the bread of life the bread of life. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Lord, you took bread with your disciples and you said, do this in remembrance of me. And the ushers are going to pass out the communion cups right now. And just take off the top film. And take out that little wafer there. Take off the top piece. Those at home, if you have some bread, if you have some crackers, whatever, get them out. If you need some help, ask your neighbor to help you.
I know you need a college degree to get the wafer out. Lord, you love us so much. Every man, every woman here in this room, you love us so much. God, thank you. Thank you for 177,880 days you were waiting to ride into Jerusalem as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our Messiah. And then a few days later, you told your disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And now it's the night before you went to the cross and you broke bread with your disciples. Do this in remembrance of me. We take this bread right now in remembrance of Jesus. Take and eat. And you took that cup and you passed it around to your disciples and you said, take and drink. This represents the blood, my blood, that's going to be shed for you on the cross. They didn't fully understood it. They didn't understand it until the next day. This is a, represents the blood of a new covenant. How Jesus bought us from Satan's grip from the dungeon, from the slave market. And he gave us eternal life in his name. Take and drink. The ushers will collect those uh, cups for you. Let's all stand. Don't forget all the things going on this week. Tuesday night, 6.30, Wednesday night, 6.30, Saturday, or uh, Thursday night, Women's Bible Study, Saturday night, Easter Sunday, Good Friday, which is going to be a great time on Friday. You know, one time that maybe your family would come to church, invite them to come. You know, don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, right? Invite them to come. Invite your neighbors to come, you know. We'll get more chairs. We have more chairs. They're out there. It's great to see all the new people that are here. Thank you for being here. and uh, All the old-timers coming back. Praise God. And, uh, Jeremy, you have some cards or something. You're gonna, if you want to see Jeremy, you can get cards. and uh, We'll get enough next week probably to give everybody. <sighs> Hosanna! Save us now. If they wouldn't have said that, the rocks crying out, Hosanna! Our Messiah has come. Save us now. Let's sing our closing song. At your name, the mountain shake and crumble. At your name, The oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out Lord of all the earth We shout your name Shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. It's your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name, 
creation sings your story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. There's no one, there is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Yahweh. Shout your name, oh Lord. If we don't shout his name, the rocks themselves are going to cry out his creation. Uh, there's refreshments out, outside for you. And the back tables, there's uh, some bread left. Um, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll let you know some of the things that are going on, just so you know. Um, on Sunday nights, we have a Mexican church that comes and uses our place every Sunday night. And uh, uh, they come from Chula Vista. They come from a lot of different places. And, uh, you know, uh, last Sunday night, I saw the pastor and I said, you know what? Any food that we have, you feel free to take it. And uh, we, we brought out some chickens that we'd gotten we paid for at the food bank we put those out there and there was probably 15 20 chickens that we put out there and uh we came on monday morning it was all gone <laughs> and i i got a message from the pastor and he says hey thank you for that food that you left for us we passed it out to our congregation and they took it to their friends and god used it and blessed a bunch of people through it we're, we're, so every Sunday night, you know, just at 6.30 or 7, you know, just be in prayer. There's a Mexican church that they're just praising God. And um, so God, we want to use this building for God's honor and glory. We don't want it just to sit still except for Sunday mornings, you know. I mean, we want to use it throughout the week. We have prayer Tuesday or Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night at 5, uh, Saturday night after the church service. And God's really been blessing that prayer time. And Teresa, come on up here. <laughs> she doesn't like it when I make her do things like that. But she is a prayer warrior. And uh, any of the ladies, you want prayer after service, come on up. She'd be glad to pray for you. And I'm going to have her close the service. Come on up here, right here. <laughs> All righty. Father God, we just give you the glory and the honor that you deserve, God. And we can never make up for the sacrifice you made for us, God, but you just want us to love you, Lord. You want us to have hearts that are open to your spirit, to your working in our lives, to growing, God, because we're, we're never going to know it all, Lord. But you want us to just persevere, Lord, and trust you. Help us keep trusting, God. Help us keep praising you, Lord, whether we feel like it or not, Lord just in sickness and health, for richer, for poorer, better, or worse, let us just always seek and trust and love you, God, as you love us every day throughout the day, and you never leave us, God. 
We just thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. It's great to see you. Come back. Bring your friends.